Hello everyone and welcome. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And on this June the 21st, when uh, the world in one form or other is thinking about refugees, we are, feel very fortunate to have Rory Stewart, Helen Benedict and all of you together in a thinking. Uh, we are not deterred by um, simple things like uh, tube strikes and rail strikes. We get together uh, nonetheless. And um, I'm in two minds about how to introduce this. Uh, there's a touch of the Inspector Clouseau walking into the Palace Hotel Gestart and saying, do you know the way to the Palace Hotel Gestart? To which the answer, if you remember your Pink Panther is yes. Um, is global order out of control? Yes. Uh, enjoy the rest of the hour, <laughs> get on with your lives. We know the scale of the problem, but the nature of a thinking is to try to come to a deeper understanding and part of our still idealistic belief in a different kind of newsroom is that by coming together we could come to a better understanding because better understandings are the first step towards mending things and so what i hope in the coming hour is that we'll hear from rory we'll hear from uh, helen and i hope also her co-author ayad but really we want to hear from you it would be really really great Stick up your digital hand. You remember the way this works. It's not so long ago. This is all that we did. Um, stick up your digital hand, put a note in the chat, and please uh, weigh in. I'm going to kick things off with uh, Rory and uh, Helen. Um, if you don't know who either of them are, um, then it's a happy coincidence that you're here. But uh, Rory Stewart, of course, um, uh, lived a life as a, as a diplomat and lived a life in the world of aid and development as a, a member of parliament, uh, a member of the government, uh, and now actually is not only closer to my world, is in the very vanguard of it because has the most, the, the most popular podcast uh, in the UK, The Rest is Politics with Alistair Campbell, which I have to confess is uh, br brilliant and a talking point in my household. Uh, and Helen Benedict, along with uh, Ed Awadawan, has, has written a book, which is a rare thing in the world of understanding the breakup of countries and communities that we are living with, a book that talks about the reality of the refugee life in a way that is actually almost like a novel. It's so kind of sensitive and human. Uh, a map of hope and sorrow goes through one particular lens, you know, refugees through Greece, but actually tells the story of the world. So Helen, thank you for joining us. And uh, and, uh, and thank you to, uh, to, to Ead, Ead Awadornan, who's here, here with us as well. All right, let's start off then. Let's get started. In. Rory, I, I suppose I started 2022 in a mood of kind of delusional optimism, thinking we are going to come out of the pandemic. And yet I should have seen, given the warnings that actually not just that there was a Ukraine war that was more likely than not, but with it, that there is a non-trivial risk of a nuclear conflict, that we've been talking about climate for three decades, but the line is continues to be in a straight line up in terms of emissions, that we now have a food crisis that probably means food riots in the second half of the year and possibly famine in 2023, we have democracy in doubt in the West and in retreat in the rest of the world. The answer is the global order is out of control. How did we get here? Why has this happened? Well, thank you, James. I mean, I think, broadly speaking, there are three dates that I want to begin us with. One of them is 1989, which is obviously the moment at which the Berlin Wall came down and where the West, the United States, and Europe entered what was a pretty long period of feeling as though it was dominant, feeling as though the center ground had come through. This was the era running through to 2005. It was the era, obviously, of Clinton, of Blair, an era where uh, Fukuyama's theories, the end of history, seemed to be coming right, where we really uh, felt through the interventions in Bosnia and Kosovo that a Western order was imposing itself in the world, where the number of democracies in the world doubled during that period through to 2005 from 89. And in fact, if we continued on that graph, by the time we got to today, uh, almost 80% of the countries in the world would be democracies. Wow. But something happened. Something happened. That turned out to be the high point. That was also the year in which the British economy was still larger than the Chinese economy. 
spoiler alert, the Chinese economy is now seven <laughs> times larger than the British economy. And that's it's going eight, eight, in 1989, the British economy was in larger. 2005, 2005, as recently yeah. as 2005, yeah. So, I mean, within, you know, very, very recently, for many of us on this call. So the change has been very dramatic. And in 2000, the, the next date I want to, to jump to is 2014 to 2016. Because that is really the moment where populism becomes a global phenomenon. This is the emergence of Bolsonaro in Brazil. This is the emergence of Modi in India. This is, of course, the emergence of Trump. It's the Brexit referendum. It's also 2014 is when Putin goes into Crimea. So the first time that European land borders have been readjusted since the Second World War. Mohammed bin Salman takes over effectively in Saudi Arabia. ISIS seizes Mosul. And by 2016, it feels like a very, very different world. We were hardly aware, I think, at the time, 2014 to 16, how much was going on in that period. So one would normally come out of that saying we'd entered an age of populism. But the final date that I want to end with is 115 days ago, which is when Putin begins to go into Ukraine. And that's the moment at which the age of populism is followed by something else quite peculiar, which is the eruption of a conflict that is tearing apart the global trading system, tearing apart not just our assumptions about security, but our assumptions about economics, about where we're going to get our wheat from, about where we're going to get our sunflower oil from, but of course, much more importantly, casting a light on China and our reliance on China and pointing to what might happen if there were a conflict between China and Taiwan, when China and Taiwan is not merely an issue of sunflower oil, Taiwan alone produces about 50% of the semiconductor chips in the world. So I'm, I'm going to finish there because I think it is a good way of thinking about the situation we found ourselves in and just how rapidly we found ourselves drawn into a very, very difficult world in which we are now facing uh, economies going into recession, where we're facing record inflation where governments have very few leaders at their disposal to do anything about it, and where the pressures which faced us before any of this happened, and primarily those the pressures of a technological revolution and a climate catastrophe, are now being faced from a position of much more political and economic weakness than would have been the case 10 years earlier. Can I, can I just, two things just to follow up, Rory, just the, the, the phase of democratization, because it, it's interesting, I think that, you know, I, I was born in 69, so I was 20 in 89, you know, and that old Napoleonic saw that, you know, show me a person's world at 20, and I can show you their worldview at 50. Well, it's, it, it's true, that period of democratization was the organizing theory of, if you like, my, my growing up, but it failed. And what you didn't explain in your first phase, that 89 to 2005, is why it peaked, why it seemed to hit a high point in 2005 and has come back since then. What's your theory of the case there? Well, I, th I think there are a range of things happening. I think one of them is that China breaks through all expectations. It's from about that moment onwards that we begin to understand that the basic theory that kept everybody going for 200 years, which was that there was a necessary relationship between democracy and prosperity. You can really chart yeah. from 1805 yeah. to 2005, a graph which suggests that relationship. And of course, many of the people that we all knew writing in the 1990s, Tom Friedman and others, were very confident that when middle classes got to a certain size, when an economy got to a certain size, it was impossible to remain as an autocracy. And of course, China defied that. And goodness, did it defy it. It took 600 million people out of poverty, put an enormous number of people into the middle class, and did not become a democracy. I, I think, of course, the second thing is that that is the moment of the surges in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's the moment at which the project of liberal intervention is really coming off the rails. That is the moment when technology is beginning to get going and it's going to show its first teeth in 2011 with the Arab Spring. And that's leading up to the populace in 2014, 2015. 
And of course, we've then got to take in the financial crisis of 2008. So I think 2005 is when things stall. And by the end of that decade, the path to populism should have been clear to us, although it wasn't that clear for those people who came in with a coalition government, the Lib Dems in 2010 in Britain. David Cameron, of course, saw himself as an heir to Tony Blair, was still very much operating in that world of 1989. So, so China's undemocratic success, the Iraq, Afghanistan, and the sort of puncturing of liberal interventionism and its self-confidence, technology and its assault on what the power of the state can do and the financial crisis and the economic consequences of that. Uh, I suppose there's an interesting thing which you didn't mention at all, Rory, and I'm going to come back to you in a moment about it, which is all of these phases, 89 to 2005, populism 14 to 16, and now the start of the uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine, democracy, populism, aggression, all of those are completely separate from the world order that was built post Second World War. You, you, didn't, you didn't reference Bretton Woods, United Nations, multilateral organizations of any kind. Is that because you, you didn't think that those were really the, the guarantors of that global world order? What, what, what do you think they were? No, I, I, think, I think they were incredibly important. And I think one of the tragedies of the that 89 to 2005 period is that in a sense, we squandered the opportunity to really make them central. Um, one of the ways I'm afraid in which we squandered them is that the US, the UK and its allies began to take for granted its ability to act as the voice of the United Nations. It's of course true in the Kosovo intervention, um, but it became more dramatically true when we get through to Libya, for example, where it was the last moment at which there was, it was possible to get Russia and China at the Security Council to vote with an, uh, an attempt to stop Gaddafi's operations in Benghazi, but which then led to a very reckless attempt at regime change, which alienated this, those powers. And I think there is a sense in which, had we shown more restraint, more prudence, there was a possibility in the 90s and early 2000s to actually make those institutions work. But instead we turned them into uh, back, I suppose, to where they were in the Cold War, which is into a paper thin cover over a very divisive world. And we largely walked out of them. Funding mm -hmm. under Trump, of course, was minimal. Uh, Britain hasn't really lent into its role on the Security Council, nor has France. China has been quite adept at using UN and multilateral institutions to further its own interests, but we've totally failed to produce a genuine global consensus. And I think refugees is probably one of the most depressing examples of this. I mean, if we go back to the, the late 70s, early 80s, we were in a situation where we were on the edge of forming a real global refugee coalition out of the Vietnamese boat people, 7980, yeah. led by Richard Holbrook. Countries were in a position where the United States, Canada, Europe, and others were taking about more than 0.05% of their populations annually. And we're now sadly in a world in which countries like Britain have really not been stepping up, in which there isn't really a sense that the developed world is prepared to commit to targets or take in significant numbers of refugees. And if it can't do that, it's very difficult to imagine how on earth it's going to deal with the bigger challenges of conflicts of technology and climate change. Rory, I'll, I'd, I'd love to come back to, and I see there's quite a lot of conversation in the chat too about the UK and its role in this and the kind of politics of the UK and the leadership in, in all of this. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Helen, if I might, just because, Helen, the, the truth is that as a general rule, we try and avoid the something weak, right? You know, the sort of protect the badger week or, you know, celebrate the tulip week. But refugee week, and now more than ever, feels like it's really something that needs to be at the front of our minds, not least because with each refugee crisis, we seem to lose attention on the last. And the thing that's interesting about Map of Hope and Sorrow is it reminds us of how recently we were really focused on what's happening on Europe's board, sort of on the uh, um, at the edge of Europe and Greece. I wonder whether you would follow up. You tell the story of about five people, in fact, of five people who've come through Greece. 
from Afghanistan, from Nigeria. What, what's your lesson overall in this? What do you take away in terms of the failure of the world order to address the issue of, of, of refugees? And Syria and Cameroon as well. Mm. Um, well, I, I want to tie it in a little bit to what Rory was saying before about the rise of populism, because of course, um, populist leaders like to stoke their power and um, stoke their fans with a, with a rhetoric of anti-refugee, anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, and basically racist villainization of refugees. And we're seeing this language being echoed all over the world. It's coming out of the Greek government. It's coming out of the UK government. It's coming out, certainly came out loud and clear from the Trump administration. Um, and the way what I saw in Greece was the way this played out on individual human lives, um, not only because of the policies funded by the EU, which were all, all about keeping refugees out of Western Europe, to funnel money into Turkey and Greece to trap refugees there, which is why, by the way, we focused on Greece. It's not just a random choice. It is the gateway to Europe, and it is the places where people have been deliberately trapped and kept waiting in limbo for year after year after year. Um, so the policies, it's not only the policies that hurt people, but it's the individual uh, reaction of everyone around them as they absorb these terrible anti-refugee messages mm. from the media, from social media in particular, um, and from these, these leaders we've been talking about. Um, and so, you know, I watched in the years I was going back to Greece, I saw more and more local Greeks turning against the refugees in their midst and, and turning from sim being sympathetic and generous to spitting, you know, racist, hateful, cruel words at them. Mm. And now look what we're doing. We're not just, uh, we're not just not taking in refugees. We're trying, you know, in the UK, we're trying to ship them to Rwanda. We're, we're putting shackles on them. That started today. Shackles, we're criminalizing people and absolutely ignoring the fact that they have an international human right to request asylum when they flee war and persecution. Where is that rhetoric anymore? Where do we even hear that being, being said from the government? Never. They're all characterized as illegal migrants, which is all part of criminalizing and villainizing, villainizing the very people we once swore to help. And, and, and Helen, I know that even this, this probably comes a bit rich for me because my family is an immigrant family. You know, we wouldn't have been here but for the welcome of this country. There are, though, very many people in the UK who, you know, good people who will say we are worried about the numbers of people coming over the channel and we're worried about who they are, what they'll bring to the country. And there's got to be a system for managing this and defending quote unquote our country and I don't want to sort of minimize their concern how do you how do you make sure that those people who've got those worries are engaged in the debate and and are part of the answer to a rising number of refugees everywhere yeah those questions how do we integrate them how do we even how do we make sure they don't change us? They don't threaten us? Those questions are all based on the disinformation that's being spouted at everybody. Um, because of course, if you actually sit down with a Syrian or an Afghan or, or a Nigerian or any of the many people I've met over the years or the people who are all around us had a cup of tea and talked, <laughs> you would stop worrying about these. I promise you, you would stop worrying because they don't come here to change you. They don't come here to change your culture. They come here because if they don't, they will die. And they come here to survive and give their children a better life and have a chance of living without being imprisoned or tortured or threatened or treated like dogs. And that is what we all, every human being want. And if we just remembered that and looked at it through that lens, 
we could stop asking these, these fearful questions about how are you going to change me? And I would ask one more question. Like, what's so great about you? What's so great about us? What are you actually afraid of changing? What, uh, you, you like to eat food or all, all different kinds of food and all kinds of different restaurants. You wear clothes from all over the world. You probably travel when you can. What is it you're afraid of? And where are you getting that idea from? And I think if everybody just stopped and, and asked themselves that question and actually dug a little and did a little more reading and a little more listening, it, would, it wouldn't be so frightening. You have, Rory, can I ask you about this? What, you've been in elected politics. There are lots and lots of people who are just instinctively sympathetic to Helen's point of view. What do you say to those voters who are not? I think it's, I think, um, pragmatically, we cannot live in a world of open borders. So the conversation has to be, I believe, around being generous and compassionate, but setting realistic targets. So that, that's why I would suggest that we look at a global refugee coalition that commits to take, for example, 0.05% of its population annually, uh, which would amount to, I would, if I was talking to a voter, I'd point out that that would mean an Afghan family of five in a town of 10,000 people. I'd point out that Canada is taking many more than that, that actually the United States under Biden is taking more than that, and that Britain historically has been taking about half of that number. Um, but I think it is important to acknowledge that voters are concerned about this. There's a very interesting book, if people haven't looked at it, Yashka Monk's book, The Great Experiment, where he tries to talk through quite thoughtfully, I think, many of the issues around assimilation and, and anxieties about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I obviously, I instinctively agree with Helen. I mean, I've spent a lot of my time, spent, um, I guess, you know, four years of my life uh, living in Afghanistan. So I, I agree that there's, there's nothing uh, to be frightened of in some existential sense, but I do think it's it's reasonable uh, to have an honest conversation with with the public, but also with refugees about the numbers of people that are going to be taken. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for um, Europe to expect to take many hundreds of thousands of people a year, year in year out, and it would be able to absorb them quite easily. So you're talking about, am I going to get my maths wrong here, Rory, which is going to be really embarrassing in front of everyone. Are you saying 30,000 people a year? Exactly. In, in Britain, probably. In the UK. Britain, UK, yeah. 30, 35,000 would be the UK's amount. US, you'd be looking at about 140,000 a year and so on and so forth. Germany, slightly more. France, about the same. I mean, it's, and the, these numbers add up. If you're taking them every year, you would be able to to do a lot. And I also think there's an interesting question around targeting. I think that this is something where I get in trouble from refugee advocates, but I think it is reasonable to expect governments to try to target the people who are most vulnerable. So I think we should be focusing, for example, on female judges in Afghanistan who are under threat from the Taliban. We should be working with NGOs on the ground to take people directly from countries like Afghanistan. I, I can see absolutely why uh, yeah, why we would feel that the most straightforward way of doing this is not to focus on people who are already safe in France crossing to Britain. So, so just so I understand then, what do you do, what do you do then with those people? Let's say you let's say you I, I, if, if I was going to be brutal, and I this is probably not the place to say it, but you know, let's stir the conversation up. I'd say if somebody's in France, they're safe. And I would be focusing on people who are genuinely at risk of their lives in other countries. So, and, and how realistic, Rory, is a global refugee coalition? Who, who signed up to it? Who do you think, because you're gonna need well, a few big countries- Somebody, to somebody would need to step up and see the point of it. I, of course, I'm, I'm beginning to conclude that it's completely unrealistic to expect Boris Johnson to lead this. I think it is something that could be led by President Biden. I think Canada could play an amazing role in leading it. They've had an extraordinary record in taking uh, refugees and asylum seekers over the years. They've got a fantastic, civilian partnership scheme where uh, people can volunteer, communities, churches can volunteer to take in more refugees in the government quota. I think Germany could play a great role, Sweden could play a great role. 
Um, and I would hope that Britain would come along. I was hoping, in fact, to bully Boris Johnson into doing it as part of his G7 presidency, but I'm increasingly convinced that we're living under a populist government that has absolutely no interest in this kind of global uh, movement. I'm going to, Rory, I, I, I just want to make one further point about the uh, global uh, refugee coalition. What do you say to those people who say, well, actually what it does is incentivizes further movement of people. What you would do is you would put out a welcome mat and a welcome that you then could not be could not deliver upon. Well, then we get into to tough territory, but the answer is it would have to be combined with a very clear system of saying that we're going to target the most vulnerable, working with UNHCR, NGOs on the grounds and others, and that we will not be taking people who turn up randomly, because the numbers that we're talking about are not sufficient to accommodate all the people that would want to move yeah. from South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe, for example. We um, forgive me. We're going to we're going to uh, um, Helen. I just I'd be interested to know your view on on that. What do you think of something like a global refugee coalition? I think it's a good idea on the whole because one of the problems is that there's so much inconsistency between the way different countries, even within the EU, for example, handle refugees, the way they the way they process them, as the word you know as we say as if they're uh, something you stick into a, a, a cuisine art, but um, because of the inconsistent standards and interviews and um, rules and because of how obscure a lot of them are, many people get stuck in limbo, many people fail to get asylum for, for tiny little technical reasons or because they didn't understand something. And I'm not the first to suggest that if we had, if this is what you mean, if we had a consistent plan across where everybody, it all worked the same, where it was very clear, where it was simplified, it would help everybody on all sides know what on earth it's about, because it's quite chaotic at the moment trying to get asylum. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come find my to your co-author, <laughs> um, Ayad Awadonan is here. Um, Ayad, I'd love to know what you think of that idea, because I know to an extent we've talked about the problem, but actually trying to think of some of the answers, I'd really be interested to hear your point of view. And then if I might, I'm going to do a handbrake turn and go to some UK politics with uh, Tom McCallum and others. I would say that there is nothing to add about what Helen said, like her answer was, was her answer is my answer too. <laughs> But, but do you think, do you, do you feel, Ed, that there is a way in which you could bring those people who are suspicious and fearful of refugees into a place where there's more confidence that there is, you know, as Rory says, not a system of open borders, but that there is a system? I, just to make it clear that I understand what you have said correctly, uh, I would say that I think we can do something when we have like really a good system, even like to make it easy on the people who want to seek asylum. The other thing I would say that before being afraid of me, as if I am coming to change your culture, mm -hmm. try to understand, like do not just hear from them, also try to hear from my side. Mm -hmm. As Helen mentioned, uh, have a chance to talk, to have coffee together. I think this is the most important thing to get to know each other pretty well. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, and the, and the beauty I should say of your book is that you do get to actually know people. It does feel personal. So thank you. Um, Rory, I'm going to do, and forgive me, Helen and Ed, we're going to do a, a slight turn just because there are a number of people who obviously have picked up on your point, Rory, about a populist government. And I think probably your note of despair. Um, Tom McCallum asked a question earlier on. I don't know whether Tom's there to put this point about, is there a space for a new kind of politics? Tom. Um, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the space. I would link the two conversations together. And your last speaker talked about having a cup of coffee with people. And I have a phrase that prejudice cannot survive proximity. That once you actually get to know human to human, it makes a big difference. And I guess my key point, other than Rory for PM in a new party, please. Um, and this is from somebody who has never and would never vote Tory, um, is that the populist type of government is a busted flush. Neoliberalism and class, neoclassical economics is a busted flush. What we now need is some brave leaders who don't have all the answers. 
And I love Roy's concept around collective and what I call collective and collaborative leadership on the refugees problem, which is to talk to people, get to understand each other and have a concept and then put it out there. It's not about the numbers you accept at the moment. It's just about the style of leadership. And uh, I'm just wondering, Rory and the other panelists' thoughts on if we were to radically change pop, uh, you know, have the Macron moment in the US or the UK, um, what would that look like? Rory. Okay, so thank you, Tom. I, I'm, I'm a, I, I'm desperately looking for that moment. I think obviously one of the problems is structural. Our electoral system makes it very, very difficult for new entrants to come through. One of the reasons that these teal independents in Australia, who women who are uh, have been independents winning around the Sydney Bay Area, who on campaigns which had a lot to do with gender equality and the environment and climate have come through is because of a preferential voting system, which means that they're able to come through in the second round. And that, of course, was the key to Macron's success in the French presidential election. He got, first time he ran, I think only in the, the low 20% in uh, the first round, but then crossed 50 in the second round. So I think we must start to think about rearranging our voting system if we're to create fresh blood, fresh ideas, fresh parties. I'm also a real believer in citizens' assemblies. That's juries of citizens selected uh, randomly to, uh, to sit and spend days thinking through knotty issues. Because the experience in Ireland around abortion, the experience in many places around the world, is that actually much smarter ideas come out of that forum. Often more compromise comes out of that forum than you get out of our very divisive party politics. But the problem, of course, the core of the whole thing is changing this involves dealing with the problem that we're asking Turkeys to vote for Christmas. We're asking the parties that benefit from this very strange, corrupt, divisive system to change it. Rory, let, let, can, we, can we just stick with this though, just pursue you a little bit further down the street on the question of new party or new platform or political takeover so next week i think you're involved in this future of britain conference there's a whole group of people trying to figure out a, a set of policies but the politics of it is really unclear is the best way through if there is this space i think you and alistair talked about it on the podcast this sense that there's a space if you like more on the center right even than the center left that that's been vacated by Boris Johnson's government, is the plan there that says, okay, we're gonna build a platform like the Teal Independence and then try and put people in key constituencies so we can affect the outcome in parliament? Is it that we build a new party around an ideological or an intellectual platform? Or is it that we try and do a takeover of an existing political party? Those seem to me to be the only real ways that you're gonna be able to get at power. So the, the aim, certainly, of this thing that we're doing uh, next week is, is a movement. It's not a party, and it's not, at the moment, about elections. It's about a space for ideas. It's about trying to build a movement of people who share values. And, of course, we hope that what's going to come out of this is political change. And political change, as you say, in the end, involves candidates standing for elections. But we're not at that stage yet. We're still trying to build a platform together. And there are some big divides within this movement. So I basically think that all these parties are a busted flush, and I think our whole system is busted flush. But of course, Alistair Campbell, who does the podcast with me, remains very, very loyal to Labour, and he understandably pushes back at me and says, no, 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 you mustn't go around criticising everybody. You've got to focus your fire on Boris Johnson. I agree. Boris Johnson is awful, much, much worse than the rest. I really do think that he's much, much worse than the Labour or Lib Dem uh, leaders. But he's not quite as much of an aberration as people want to think. I feel, as somebody who's a member of Parliament, that he is, in a sense, an extreme product of a system that generates these kinds of people, that he's a product of partly social media, partly of our electoral system, partly about the, of the way that people campaign. And that even if we got rid of Boris Johnson, if we keep the current system, we're going to get many more of the same. So yes, I guess we won't change. Yeah, I get, I get that. I guess the question I've got is when you say we're not at that stage yet, 
does that mean get a coherent set of ideas, bring together a group of people, and then build a new party? Or do you believe that actually the British system won't admit a new party, in which case you have to do something else? Well, maybe you build a new party, maybe you build a constitutional movement. I mean, one of the interesting things in Scotland is there was a sort of geeky group of people who in the mid 1980s started working out plans for Scottish devolution, which became the template for what happened when Labour was elected in 97. So I think there's a lot to be said in the world for planting the seeds, for getting the ideas going. It may take us, sadly, 10, 15 years for these things to break through. But what I would like is a vision that actually defined our whole constitution, set out the kind of electoral system we were going for, the kind of parliament we were going for, the way in which we use things like citizens' assemblies, the values we were standing for. And I think on the back of that, we are leading what I would hope would be a peaceful revolution. <laughs> okay, Rory, well, on the basis that no good deed goes unpunished, thank you for me coming and doing this with us this evening. I'm not letting you go here, but we at Tortoise started this project in 2019. Actually, Matt Dancona here is the sort of brains of the whole thing on the constitution, on what we call the rules. And so no sooner have we closed this Zoom call than we'll be messaging you saying, can we get you together to talk about the rules? We've got to figure out how we kind of coordinate all of the different organizations that I think really are focus now on a, a an agreed constitution, an agreed set of rules in the UK, because the rule breaking has been so blatant and reckless and shameless that it feels like there's a time now to do something about it. Um, I, I'm going to just just go to Helen for a moment, and if I might, I'd like to bring in Gwyneth um, uh, Peace if I can. Um, Helen, there are a number of people who are asking questions about a specific policy in the UK, which is the Rwanda deportation policy. What, I, I, I assume you're against it, in fact, your comments suggest you are. What do you think should be done about it? About the Rwanda policy or with yes. our people coming over on boats? No, no, the Rwanda policy. What do you, if you're against it, how do you respond? Um, it is a cruel, insane, and I think, and largely illegal policy. It should just, it should just be banished. What, what, it, it makes no sense to take a Syrian or an Iraqi or an African from a different country, a different culture, and send them to this place they know nothing about, where they have to be processed, they have to go through asylum all over again, a place which has a, a, a terrible record of human rights, where there's no freedom of expression or press, um, where people are fleeing <laughs> Uh, for that, for other, for political reasons already, it's like, it's very close to refoulement. It, it isn't sending people back to the place they they fled, but it's it's sending people back to an authoritarian government of the type they fled, mm -hmm. for the most part. So, uh, uh, what should be done instead? Use all that money to give people a humane, reasonable, legal hearing for their asylum, to help them. Um, integrate with language lessons and training and decent housing and let them work and treat them as their human rights uh, demand that they be treated. I do want to answer a question that came up in the chat room earlier about what do we think about um, people who come over on those dangerous boats. Of course, that's how people get to Greece as well. You don't get on a rubber dinghy or a little wooden boat that's overloaded with people to risk your life unless staying behind is worse. We seem to forget that. People don't come do, they don't put themselves through that just to make money or for a dream or for a lark. They do it because they're desperate. So this, this leads me back to something Rory said, which is that they're safe in France. I would question that. It depends mm -hmm. what you mean by safe. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know quite a lot of refugees in France. I wouldn't call them safe. Yeah, bombs are not falling. But um, they're being persecuted by the police. They're not getting asylum. They can't get work. They can't get decent pay. They don't feel safe. They, mm -hmm. they can't make an actual life. And that's why they keep um, trying. Also, a lot of them come from English speaking countries, which is why they want to come here. So at least they have a language or they have families here. I saw a statistical breakdown that a great, I think at least 50% of them 
come because they have family members here. Who are we to deny someone the chance to be with their family? We should be helping them. So the answer isn't to try and punish the smugglers by punishing their victims, which makes no sense at all. The answer is to give them legal ways to come here and, and give them legal a legal chance to apply for asylum and a, and a fair hearing. I mean, your point, one, one of your points, Helen, about the legality of this, one of the things that's extraordinary is that, you know, when the Rwanda policy first emerged, it, it must have taken us 24 hours to identify the Israeli group that had reported and investigated exactly Israel's experiment with this five years, which ended up not only with a colossal waste of money, all but I think seven of the 4,500 people deported from Israel to Rwanda having left the country and a Supreme Court ruling in Israel that deemed it illegal. So how this has happened in the UK, if you if you want to listen to a really, really thoughtful piece of reporting on it, my colleague or my contributing editor at Tortoise, the barrister, Hashi Mohammed, has done Visit Rwanda and it's really worth worth listening to. Um, I, I just was going to, Roy, I was going to bring you back in because I don't know whether Gwyneth Peace is still here. Gwy when you were talking very early on, Rory, about the sort of 14 to 16 rise of populism, Putin, MBS, etc., I saw at the time that Gwyneth raised a question not about totalitarianism in the rest of the world but the rise of fascism and strongman government in the west and, and Gwyneth I don't know what prompted that thought whether you wanted to put it to Rory yeah well I mean I, I think the, the two things oh, I don't know, Rory one second do you want to hear from Gwyneth yeah sorry yeah sorry I'm sorry Apologies. hi no I mean it's just um there's been so much on social media around the potential rise of fascism how far are we as a country and places like the US sinking into sort of that rhetoric? Um, and I know that Mary Black even sort of raised it in the Houses of Parliament, which was probably the first time I think that that's been mentioned. Um, so it is a concern that are we as in the West, and there was also Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen in France, are we in the West sliding ever closer to fascism without doing anything about it? Well, I think there are uh, there are many themes going on here which connect populism, more extreme populism, more mild populism with fascism, authoritarianism. Um, they, they obviously come from common roots. And one of the things that these movements have in common is they tend to speak for the people or claim to speak for the people against the elites, although often it turns out the people they're speaking for is not the majority of the people. It's just whoever their supporters happen to be. They have a common indifference to constitutions. They like constitutions only insofar as it actually suits them. But if it's necessary to lie to the Queen or prorogue Parliament or throw MPs out of Parliament or not replace your ethics advisor or do any of that stuff, you're happy to do it if it helps you. Um, I, I think, though, it's also important to understand that there are a lot of different things going on and that the version that we have with Boris Johnson is deeply disturbing, but I think it is more a sort of daily degradation of our political life. It's a sort of humiliating, shameful process that uh, alienates people and leads to poor government. I, I don't think we're, you know, facing the 1930s in Britain, and I think it's important to, to get some level of uh, difference in, because otherwise, I mean, I, my friends in Latin America are completely obsessed with these kinds of subjects. And every time there's an election, it's viewed as a fight between fascism and communism. And often whoever wins doesn't quite produce the 1930s. Uh, there's been you know, a lot of communists elected in Latin America over the last two, three years without very dramatic impact. So I think what I'm feeling in Britain is something that's shameful and deeply depressing and terrible governance, but but it's not it's not hit this journey. But, uh, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> I, I was with you all the way until the end of that sentence and I thought to myself, well, hang on a second, that is a very, very low bar. So, so let, let, let's just do stick with uh, the, the problems of the UK and I'm, I'm going to bring my colleague Matt Dancona in, in in a moment but I just want to ask you Rory around we, we frame this as a breakdown of the global order one of the questions that's knocking around this week Matt wrote a really good piece about it the Atlantic's had a go the FT you just feel people nibbling away at the very awkward question 
something of a taboo in the UK, which is Brexit. And in terms of the breakdown of global order, that's obviously been one of the key elements of it. But is there a way back to have a meaningful and sensible debate about Brexit? It's unbelievably difficult. I mean, at the moment, the Conservatives famously, this guy, David Canzini, who's uh, uh, Boris Johnson's campaign czar, had a meeting very recently in which he said to his campaign team, anyone who thinks in this room the next election is not about Brexit should leave now. So we need to bear in mind that the risk of people like uh, me and many people on this call who are totally opposed to Boris Johnson and want to get rid of him is that he is in a sense hoping that we talk about Brexit and that he can make the next election about Brexit. But there is a way to talk about Brexit. And I think the way to talk about it is to talk about a bungled Brexit, to point out that the Brexit that has been delivered is so bad that it, there's a needless self-harm in this, that the Theresa May version of Brexit was immeasurably better, that a customs union Brexit would have been much better. A customs union Brexit would not just have been much better for the British economy, would have given much more confidence to investors, would have been much better for farmers, much better for the automobile industry, but it also would have avoided the terrible problems that we're now facing around Northern Ireland. So I, I would see a route back to saying we can have a much closer economic and political relationship with the EU, but put the blame on the government for a bungle Brexit rather than allowing them to have a fight with us about the details for customs union. And what do you think, Rory, of the Nigel Farage, um, it's time we left the ECHR and quote unquote complete Brexit? I assume well, you would get yeah, your, you know, I, I guess you're against it, but my point is the politics of it. Yeah. Well, obviously, the, the politics of it is the politics of populism and fairy stories. I mean, essentially, these people are pushing for a, a vision of absolute sovereignty, which is completely impossible. They're not just trying to leave the European Commission of Human Rights, which incidentally was set up by conservatives, British conservatives in the 1950s, and which, of course, we were very pleased with through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when we were going around telling off other people about human rights. We just didn't like it when occasionally people told us something about human rights. Um, but it's also, they're also challenging the World Trade Organization now. I mean, the reason the ethics advisor resigned is that Boris about trying to challenge international law and WTO. This is a completely mad world they're getting into. Obviously, for us to function as a global citizen, to be taken seriously, we have to work in these global bodies. And, it's terrifying that having taken us out of the European Union, torn up single market customs union, and now in the process of tearing up stability and peace in Ireland, they're now thinking about things like leaving the ECHR and challenging the WTO on steel. It's mad. Matt, what, 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 do you, what do you make of this, the line from ECHR, Brexit, all the way through to global order? I worry that in these conversations that we're too temperamentally optimistic and upbeat. Yeah, you want me to bring a little bit of gloom to the uh, to the carnival? <laughs> um, okay. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think um, Hamlin Rory made some amazingly, you know, perceptive points, and um, I think, I think one of the things that underpins all of this is is a, a version by the political class which has been turbocharged by technology to speaking um, about difficulty, which is odd actually, because if you look at the history of great political leaders, um, Lincoln, Kennedy, um, Churchill, Mandela, they've, they've actually talked up difficulty. They've talked up the, 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 the difficulty of great historic tasks. And it's quite, quite recent that we've pretended that it's easy to do things. It's easy to govern well. It's easy to manage a nation. Um, and immigration is a case in point because the case for immigration um, is very strong. And what's more, it's it was settled 60 years ago uh, when we decided to base our economy and our public services upon migrant labor. And people who claim they were never consulted seem to forget the hundreds of economic decisions and public service, use of public services they make every week, every month that are dependent upon migrant labor. So 
the the I think one of the big disasters uh, to localize it was the Remain campaign in 2016. The decision not to talk about immigration positively at all was symptomatic of a broader failure in the political class to say actually some of these things are complicated and left the field clear to a version of conservatism that is based on the proposition that everything is easy and if it isn't easy it's not worth doing and if it proves to be hard you just remove the obstacle or the um, system or the structure or the advisor that is in your way um, and that is that is actually very frightening because what you what you see now is a kind of creeping autocracy it's it, obviously it isn't um crystal knocked and it isn't the 1930s but i think it was george carlin who said that when fascism came to america it would come wearing chinos and trainers and in this country it's come through have i got news for you and the spectator um which is an alarming reflection really uh and i do think that the the next generation of of if there is an answer to all this, it lies in a form of political leadership that is prepared to, to talk about difficulty and is prepared to, to make that leap because there's conspicuously nobody in the main parties who's really willing to do that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this new movement will encourage that culture. Helen, just as we come towards the close, will you just pick up on... Matt's point. Are there are there places or people where you do see a leadership that you think is is communicating communicating over either the media coverage or the political argument that gives you hope that the way in which we talk and think about refugees will change? Well, there's one place that's given me hope, even though it's had a few bumps, and that is Iceland, where I just was with with my co-author Iad. Yeah. who um, is now living there. Um, the vast majority of Icelanders are, are pro-immigration. They need people. They uh, know they need people to keep going. Um, and they're pro-refugee rights. They're a very sympathetic country. And even though there was a recent blip because the government wanted to send 300 refugees back to Greece and some to Iraq, on the whole, um, the, most of the population is not thinking that way. So that's one example. I think, you know, Canada's been up and down, but mostly very good. Um, the US where I now live is, is with Trump just appalling. And we're still trying to dig our way out of that. Um, but there is, unfortunately a huge huge swell you know of this of this prejudice and hatred for uh for refugees everywhere it, unless they're ukrainian unless they're white and european um and the difference between <laughs> the way they're treated and the way of everybody else from elsewhere treated is so stark i hardly need to even lay it out um but those are two examples they're not um as encouraging as I would like to see. You've but, but, yes, but but actually, Helen, there's something incredibly valuable you can, I don't know whether you've even seen in the chat, just how valuable it is to have some examples. Yeah, yeah that's really, really and, and I want to say before we get too dispirited, if you don't mind me mentioning my book again, yeah. uh, on, and the, the last chapter is all about what we can do to help both on, on what the EU should be doing, the reforms of the EU and the UK and the US, but also what we can do as individuals, mm -hmm. because sometimes when we have too much of this gloomy talk, we start to feel completely paralyzed and helpless. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things we can do. It, we, can, we can pay attention to the immigration and refugee policies of the people we vote for and adjust our votes accordingly all the way to, as Iad mentioned, inviting your, your neighbor to tea. Um, being kind. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of the people in the book have just talked about how one kind gesture, one welcoming smile can make the biggest difference to them of everything. And we forget that. We have, we ha if we just remember to act human sometimes, I don't want to sound too soppy, but I think we do forget. But Ellen, I, I, the, I, I like that a lot and not least, you know, just the the, the encouragement to be kind is no small thing. That said, I am going to end with a question to Rory, which is not about being kind, but about being tough. And we started 
with I started this with a having not seen Ukraine and all the risk and all the suffering around it at the start of the year and having not seen that coming it, we're now nearly four year, months into this war how much or this invasion I should say how much do you think Rory that actually one of the reasons why the global order is falling apart is that it's lost its steel and by that I mean quite specifically notwithstanding the fear of Putin and the risks associated with you know, enraging him, that the failure to act militarily in Ukraine has meant that we've tried to marshal economic resources, diplomatic and political resources, all to no effect. And there's a lesson here that sometimes you are going to have to act militarily. Absolutely. I think the route to Ukraine comes through our failure to be restrained at the right times and our failure to act at the right times. So Obama's red line on Syria and his failure to act after the chemical weapons were used is a classic example of something that was a display of weakness. Our very poor, weak response to Putin's invasion of Crimea in 2014 is another example. But perhaps the most dramatic example, which I blame for Putin's action, is the way we behaved in Afghanistan in August of last year. We were in a situation in which there were 2,500 American troops left on the ground, in which there had been no US casualties for 18 months, no British casualties since 2014. There was literally no reason at all for us to leave Afghanistan. By leaving Afghanistan, we handed the country to the Taliban. Uh, and that means that women over the age of 11 at the moment are unable to go to school. We betrayed nearly $2 trillion worth of investment. 20 years of presence, totally unnecessarily. Those 2,500 US soldiers could have remained there indefinitely. There are 25,000 American soldiers in South Korea. And Biden's display of extraordinary weakness there, I think, is one of the contributing factors to what we're seeing now. And sorry then, Rory, then to press you, if you were in Downing Street when that convoy was stuck in the mud outside of Kiev, or now, given what you see in Eastern Ukraine, do you authorize or encourage Western military action against it? No, Western military action against Russia would not be something that I would uh, authorize. I th definitely think we should be supplying very generously, but going into a hot war with a nuclear armed power as nationalistic as Russia and with the resources of Russia would be a very foolish thing to do. So your so so what's your prescription? So prescription for Ukraine is yeah. that we continue to do much more to provide support. Actually, the UK has done okay. The US has done an enormous amount. The US has provided nearly 10 times as much as any other individual country, twice as much as all the other countries combined. Germany really needs to step up. It's got an enormous amount that it could provide that it's not providing. But we have to be a realistic unfortunately, about what we're facing now with Russia. And we didn't need to be facing that, but we are facing a very, very serious adversary. And the fact that Russia was weak in those first 100 days, behaved very badly, should not lead us to underestimate just what a tough adversary Russia is, and we shouldn't be drawn into a hot war. Well, thank you. All right. Well, that was A, clear and also concise. You don't really get both of those things in a conversation as complicated as this. So a, a big thank you to you. Because I do want to make sure we end up on time. I, I, I suppose that the, the note that I hit, I'm actually going to borrow from Tom McCallum's phrase, which is collective and collaborative, and yours were already constitutional. It does feel to me as though the best that can come of this, as well as your point, Helen, around kindness and a greater deal of personal humanity is that we're radicalized by what we're seeing and we're in, forced to engage in our politics in a way in which we've been too willing to disengage and you know for what it's worth you know Helen and Ed in your in your book and Rory and what you're doing with the rest of politics and with the conference next week I hope that people are going to switch on at the very least to thinking and some new ideas and then let's see what action what movement what politics flows from that. So just to say thank you for your time. Thank you for helping us think through this and coming away with it. Um, certainly pretty downbeat about the realities, but at least uh, encouraged and inspired to try and think around how we do something about it. So a big thank you, Rory, a big thank you, Helen, and a big thank you, everyone joining us at Tortoise tonight. Mm -hmm.